And now we can tell of the Hebrews, a Semitic people, not so important in their own time as in their influence upon the later history of the world. They were settled in Judea long before 1000 BC, and their capital city after that time was Jerusalem. Their story is interwoven with that of the great empires on either side of them, Egypt to the south and the changing empires of Syria, Assyria, and Babylon to the north. Their country was an inevitable high road between these latter powers and Egypt. Their importance in the world is due to the fact that they produced a written literature. A world history, a collection of laws, chronicles, psalms, books of wisdom, poetry, and fiction. And political utterances which became at last what Christians known as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. This literature appears in history in the 4th or 5th century BC. Probably this literature was first put together in Babylon. Pharaoh, Necho II, invaded the Assyrian Empire while Assyria was fighting for life against Medes, Persians, and Chaldeans. Josiah king of Judah opposed him and was defeated and slain at Megiddo, 608 BC. Judah became a tributary to Egypt and when Nebuchadnezzar the Great, the new Chaldean king in Babylon, rolled back Necho into Egypt, he attempted to manage Judah by setting up puppet kings in Jerusalem. The experiment failed, the people massacred his Babylonian officials, and he then determined to break up this little state altogether, which had long been playing off Egypt against the northern empire. Jerusalem was sacked and burnt, and the remnant of the people was carried off captive to Babylon. There they remained until Cyrus took Babylon, 538 BC. He then collected them together and sent them back to resettle their country and rebuild the walls and temple of Jerusalem. Before that time the Jews do not seem to have been a very civilized or united people. Probably only a very few of them could read or write. In their own history one never hears of the early books of the Bible being read. The first mention of a book is in the time of Josiah. The Babylonian captivity civilized them and consolidated them. They returned aware of their own literature, an acutely self-conscious and political people. Their Bible at that time seems to have consisted only of the Pentateuch, that is to say the first five books of the Old Testament as we know it. In addition, as separate books they already had many of the other books that have since been incorporated with the Pentateuch into the present Hebrew Bible, Chronicles, the Psalms and Proverbs for example. The accounts of the creation of the world, of Adam and Eve and of the flood, with which the Bible begins, run closely parallel with similar Babylonian legends. They seem to have been part of the common beliefs of all the Semitic peoples. So too the stories of Moses and of Samson have Sumerian and Babylonian parallels. But with the story of Abraham and onward begins something more special to the Jewish race. Abraham may have lived as early as the days of Hammurabi in Babylon. He was a patriarchal Semitic nomad. To the book of Genesis, the viewer must go for the story of his wanderings and for the stories of his sons and grandchildren and how they became captive in the land of Egypt. He traveled through Canaan, and the God of Abraham, says the Bible story, promised this smiling land of prosperous cities to him and to his children. And after a long sojourn in Egypt, and after fifty years of wandering in the wilderness under the leadership of Moses, the children of Abraham, grown now to a host of twelve tribes, invaded the land of Canaan from the Arabian deserts to the east. They may have done this somewhere between 1600 BC and 1300 BC. There are no Egyptian records of Moses nor of Canaan at this time to help out the story. But at any rate, they did not succeed in conquering any more than the hilly backgrounds of the promised land. The coast was now in the hands, not of the Canaanites, but of newcomers, those Aegean peoples, the Philistines, and their cities, Gaza, Gath, Ashdod, Ascalon, and Joppa successfully withstood the Hebrew attack. 
For many generations the children of Abraham remained an obscure people of the hilly back country engaged in incessant bickerings with the Philistines and with the kindred tribes about them, the Moabites, the Midianites, and so forth. The viewers will find in the book of Judges a record of their struggles and disasters during this period. For very largely, it is a record of disasters and failures frankly told. For most of this period, the Hebrews were ruled, so far as there was any rule among them, by priestly judges selected by the elders of the people, but at last some went towards 1000 BC they chose themselves a king, Saul, to lead them in battle. But Saul's leading was no great improvement upon the leading of the judges. He perished under the hail of Philistine arrows at the battle of Mount Gilboa, his armor went into the temple of the Philistine Venus, and his body was nailed to the walls of Bethshan. His successor David was more successful and more politic. With David dawned the only period of prosperity the Hebrew peoples were ever to know. It was based on a close alliance with the Phoenician city of Tyre, whose king Hiram seems to have been a man of very great intelligence and enterprise. He wished to secure a trade route to the Red Sea through the Hebrew hill country. Normally Phoenician trade went to the Red Sea by Egypt, but Egypt was in a state of profound disorder at this time. There may have been other obstructions to Phoenician trade along this line. And at any rate Hiram established the very closest relations both with David and with his son and successor Solomon. Under Hiram's auspices the walls, palace and temple of Jerusalem arose, and in return Hiram built and launched his ships on the Red Sea. A very considerable trade passed northward and southward through Jerusalem. And Solomon achieved a prosperity and magnificence. Unprecedented in the experience of his people. He was even given a daughter of Pharaoh in marriage. But it is well to keep the proportion of things in mind. At the climax of his glory Solomon was only a little subordinate king in a little city. His power was so transitory that within a few years of his death, Shishak the first Pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty had taken Jerusalem and looted most of its splendors. The account of Solomon's magnificence given in the books of Kings and Chronicles is questioned by many critics. They say that it was added to and exaggerated by the patriotic pride of later writers. But the Bible account read carefully is not so overwhelming as it appears at the first reading. Solomon's temple, if one works out the measurements, would go inside a small suburban church. And his 1400 chariots ceased to impress us when we learned from an Assyrian monument that his successor Ahab sent a contingent of 2000 to the Assyrian army. It is also plainly manifest from the Bible narrative that Solomon spent himself in display and overtaxed and overworked his people. At his death the northern part of his kingdom broke off from Jerusalem and became the independent kingdom of Israel. Jerusalem remained the capital city of Judah. The prosperity of the Hebrew people was short-lived. Hiram died, and the help of Tyre ceased to strengthen Jerusalem. Egypt grew strong again. The history of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah becomes a history of two little states ground between, first, Syria, then Assyria, and then Babylon to the north and Egypt to the south. It is a tale of disasters and of deliverances that only delay disaster. It is a tale of barbaric kings ruling a barbaric people. In 721 BC, the kingdom of Israel was swept away into captivity by the Assyrians and its people utterly lost to history. Judah struggled on until in 604 BC, as we have told, it shared the fate of Israel. There may be details open to criticism in the Bible story of Hebrew history from the days of the judges onward, but on the whole, it is evidently a true story which squares with all that has been learnt in the excavation of Egypt and Assyria and Babylon during the past century. It was in Babylon that the Hebrew people got their history together and evolved their tradition. The people who came back to Jerusalem at the command of Cyrus were a very different people in spirit and knowledge from those who had gone into captivity. They had learnt civilization. 
and the development of their peculiar character a very great part was played by certain men, a new sort of men, the prophets, to whom we must now direct our attention. These prophets marked the appearance of new and remarkable forces in the steady development of human society.